I'm Ushma Neal, Executive Editor for the Journal of Clinical Investigation. Today we're here for the first of our interviews in a series called Conversation with Giants in Medicine. Today we're joined by Dr. Harold Varmus, who's the current director of the National Cancer Institutes. He's previously served as director of the National Institutes of Health from 1993 to 1999. He also served as president of Memorial Sloan Cancer Center here in New York City between the year 2000 and 2010. Among his many awards and accolades, Dr. Varmus was awarded the 1989 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine together with Michael Bishop. This award acknowledged their research on the cellular basis for onco, uh, retroviral oncogenes. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Varmus. My pleasure. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit um, about your beginnings in science. Mm -hmm. um, I was brought up, as you mentioned, in the household of a general practitioner. My mother was a, was a psychiatric social worker. Um, there was an anticipation that a nice Jewish boy in the south shore of Long Island uh, who was raised by professional parents um, who had a very strong public spirit, spirited uh, outlook would end up being a physician. And indeed, that was my assumption all through high school. But when I got to college at Amherst, um, I suddenly discovered a much wider world, um, ended up being an, an English major, writing a thesis on Dickens, running the school paper, um, getting a C in organic chemistry, and uh, deciding after a prolonged period of ambiguity to go to graduate school in English, which I did for a year. And during that year, um, decided I would reapply to medical school, which I had decided not to go to before. Uh, then I went to Columbia and actually um, loved it. Um, I changed my mind about specialties many times. I went there thinking that uh, as somebody who liked words and books and was interested in the workings of the mind, I'd be a psychiatrist, um, soon dissuaded from that, uh, became interested in, um, in internal medicine in part because of its narrative aspects, that is the, the medical history and the, the, the detection part of it, figuring out what's wrong with somebody. Um, but I'd never done any science and that was a key element and it was only, I believe, because um, I didn't have much choice as a a draft eligible MD in the late 60s who was fiercely opposed to the Vietnam War, that uh, you know, it, was, it was Canada or the public health service. And fortunately, despite any research credentials, uh, I was uh, matched with a laboratory, which was not by any means my first choice, but I'm very glad I ended up there. This was uh, Ira the Paston's lab. That was Ira, Ira, Ira Paston's lab. And that was a big plunge because I signed up to work with Ira. Um, well, I, listed him on my, on my list of choices because he was an endocrinologist by training, was in an endocrinology branch, uh, was working on um, release of thyroxine from the thyroid. It seemed like the kind of problem I could work on with my limited background in science and my interest in internal medicine. Um, I liked endocrinology. It seemed one of the rash, most rational of medical subspecialties. Uh, but before I arrived on the NIH campus, which it was two years after I had been matched with Ira, he developed a brand new interest was, which turned out to be incredibly important to me, and that was an interest in learning how um, cyclic AMP might work in regulating genes and bacteria using studies of the LAC operon. Now, I didn't know anything about the LAC operon, really, and uh, didn't know anything about bacterial genetics, and I had to go to the house staff library at, at the Presbyterian Hospital and try to figure out what Jacob and Minot had done. I had a very hard time sorting it out. Um, but as soon as I got to the NIH and began to learn about the tools of molecular biology and developed my first assay, in which I saw I really could measure stuff accurately and determine how much RNA was made from the LAC operon in response to, um, in response to cyclic AMP or glucose. Uh, in um, this model system using molecular hybridization. I was really excited and uh, I learned the, the power of having an instrument to measure things and I learned how exciting it is to be able to tell your colleague at the next bench you had a result and suddenly I was hooked after, you know, at the age of 28. So do you really ground your developing interest in laboratory science to that time? Ah, absolutely. I mean, that, that, that was the key moment entering Iris lab and uh, suddenly thinking, A, this is fun and exciting. Second, it's, uh, it is um, something I can do. 
Um, at the same time, I realized that I didn't have the grounding in, in this field of bacterial genetics. Moreover, I wanted to make some use of all those years of medical school and house staff training and you know, my inherent interest in medical problems. So I began to look around for an area of research that was closer to my medical background. And in those days, the NIH was, uh, um, was uh, um, I'm not going to use the word blessed, I don't use that like that word, but uh, was um, uh, endowed with, with some wonderful courses taught by experts in their fields. And I learned about cancer biology and saw how frustrating it had been to try to understand how a normal cell becomes a cancer cell. But I also saw that uh, there were a couple of tools that looked really attractive, and those were tumor viruses, viruses that cause cancer in animals. And they were remarkable to me because it was a little bit like working um, gene by gene with the lac operon in bacteria. So bacteria have a lot of genes too, and the reason I was able to study the lac operon specifically is because we made viruses uh, called bacteriophage that had pieces of the lac operon, and we could use those pieces to measure the, the uh, genetic behavior of the lac operon. So I thought, we can do the same thing with tumor viruses. Cells are complex, they have 20 or 30,000 genes, maybe more, maybe 100,000, but if we have tumor viruses that have only a few genes, and they are competent to change the behavior of a normal cell, and they behave like a cancer cell, that's great. Then we can actually do something to try to understand how cancer arises. What do those genes do? What are they? Where do they come from? And, uh, and how do these viruses grow? Um, so that was important to me because, it, first of all, I had learned by working with bacteria and trying to understand gene regulation and how cyclic AMP worked uh, that model systems were unbelievably important in trying to sort out more complex problems of human disease that are very difficult to, to approach using existing techniques that existed then. I always found it hard to convince students that there was a time when we could do research without molecular cloning, without DNA sequencing. And you know, we did learn a lot of fundamental things, just it was very difficult to answer fairly, what now seem like fairly simple questions. Now, how did you match this passion for working on such a cellular and, and tiny basis with also being a house staff member? I mean, I was a clinical medicine. associate at the NIH because nobody would take me as a pure research associate. I didn't have any research experience. So I was working in the clinic one day a week and spending some time on the wards, but that was fine. Um, but and this what, was in internal medicine? Yeah, it was, well, when I was at the NIH, I was in the endocrinology branch, so I was okay. seeing only endocrine patients, almost all thyroid patients. But um, then there was a choice to make after the NIH. That is, um, I knew I wasn't going to stay there. I wanted to go out into the academic community. I wasn't crazy about Washington. i just gotten married. We wanted to go to California. Um, so I began shopping around for a place to work um, and some, for something to do. And I knew I was interested in tumor viruses. There were a whole range of tumor virologists in California, happily. Um, unfortunately, the great Renato Del Becco didn't even want to interview me, rejected me twice by mail. That was disappointing. But there were a number of people in the Bay Area who were interested. Uh, and the odd thing, um, this might be useful for current trainees, is that I went out to California to interview with a couple of doyens in the field, uh, perhaps the most reputable of whom was a man named Harry Rubin, who was incredibly important because he helped to keep alive work with Rouse sarcoma virus, the virus that I used mostly in, in, in uh, the time, 25 years or so, in which I was focused on retroviruses. Uh, and Harry had trained a lot of great people and was a, a bit of a maverick, but um, you know, he had kept this field going at a time when it was very difficult to do anything substantial. Um, but I could see I was not going to get along with Harry. And I asked him for other ideas, and he said that, he, that one of his former students had gone to San Francisco, to U University of California, San Francisco Medical School, and was working with a couple of other folks um, on these same viruses, and maybe I should drop in and see them. So completely unannounced, I just walked into this lab on the fourth floor of Health Sciences East at UCSF and uh, introduced myself to uh, the three faculty there, one of whom was Mike Bishop, Mike who Bishop. became my partner for many years, uh, and uh, another fellow named Leon Leventhal, who had been Bishop's mentor at NIH and had brought 
um, Mike to UCSF when he went to UCSF, when he went to UCSF. So there was a little coterie of people ready to work as a team, which was quite interesting. And you know, now you know, we're at a time where team, in, 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 where team science is a big issue and we don't really know how to balance the demands for scientific independence against the, the virtues of being part of a team where, where multi disciplines work together. In the event, um, I, when I entered this lab unannounced and started chatting with, with these folks, it became very clear that Mike and I had a very, very similar perspective. He had cut his teeth on science at the NIH as I had. He came from a liberal arts background, small college. Um, he um, was, had learned molecular hybridization, which been, had been my major tool working on the lac operon while he was trying to study how polioviruses replicate. So we had a lot of things in common. We knew that these technologies were going to be important in pursuing the two questions that guided my research for at least 25 or 30 years and arguably still guide it. That is how do retroviruses grow, something I don't work on these days but did for a long time, and how do retroviruses cause cancer. Now we didn't call them retroviruses at that juncture because this was slightly before a reverse transcriptase was mm -hmm. discovered. But nevertheless, this class of RNA tumor viruses was very inviting. And, and it turns out that we just made some very good choices that, uh, that it turns out that at least the way history evolved, retroviruses were an incredibly potent source of n deep knowledge about, uh, about how human cancer arises. And I would argue DNA tumor viruses proved to be less so, although very useful. Secondly, um, retroviruses, of course, include the AIDS virus, which was, had been very important medically, um, and retroviruses led us to a class of genes called proto-oncogenes mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, that just proved to be um, crucial in, in, in human cancer. And we look at the advances that have occurred therapeutically in the last few years. Most of them are the result of um, understanding mutations in the cellular genes that are the precursors to retroviral cancer genes. Right, so when you transitioned from UCSF to the NIH, how were you able to make the decision to leave such exciting research? So the fact is that after arriving at UCSF and becoming part of this team and having a very long-term partnership with Mike Bishop and other folks out there, you know, I was living in a kind of scientific nirvana. Great colleagues, unlimited potential to do science, substantial but not overwhelming teaching responsibilities, no need to work to, to serve on committees. Um, and you know, I was having a feast there. I love living in California. I do a lot of things that require mountains, sea, seashore, good roads for bike riding. riding. Um, I enjoyed the culture of San Francisco. So there were a lot of reasons to be there and stay there forever. But I had what I guess you could call a midlife crisis. Um, I, Mike and I had just won a Nobel Prize. I hesitate to self-advertise with that, but it did play a very significant role in my life history because up until then, you know, I was a, a respected scientist, but not someone you would necessarily turn to for the, the verdict on some social or political issue. But that little medallion gives you a certain authority, and if you want to use it, you can use it very effectively. And I began to realize that just after we took our trip to Stockholm and people began to ask, you know, would you speak out on this, this, or this? Now, I didn't think I had the knowledge or um, the, the right to speak out on issues of politics uh, in, in general or you know, whether we should be going to war with certain countries. But I did think that uh, I knew enough about how the politics of science operated and what the effect of governmental decisions would be on training, funding of scientists, the integrity of science, uh, the way in which we support science financially. And I began talking about those things and got quite interested in how these issues are worked out, the role of the NIH, how um, the scientific community interacts with the administration, with Congress. Um, and uh, as those activities increased, uh, they, um, over the next two or three years, in the early 90s, uh, suddenly an opportunity loomed uh, I was already interested in taking on some kind of leadership position, um, was turned down for one job I was interested in. Uh, always good to remember that. You know, my brother-in-law said, 
how good does your CV have to be <laughs> to get, a, get that job? Um, but um, uh, in early 93, just after Clinton uh, became president, uh, the directorship of the NIH became available. And uh, I thought, why not at least have a look at it? And uh, so I threw my hat in the ring and was interviewed and got along with Donna Shalala, who's the secretary of HHS, and uh, the job was mine. Right. Well, then turning a little bit more towards mm. the administrative side of things, you mm. oversaw a legendary doubling of the NIH budget. Well, that's, that's a bit of hyperbole. I mean, I, um, first of all, um, while I was there and while I was instrumental in getting Congress prepared to do something like that, it would not have happened without a number of other factors. One is that the economy was very strong. Second, we had a Congress that was sufficiently bipartisan to be able to work together on a few issues like medical research. Um, we had strong um, and outspoken leaders of industry who came to, maybe it's a surprise to some people, to the Republican leaders of the House in particular, uh, including Mr. Gingrich, Mr. Livingston, and other folks who are not always the most loved in the scientific community, and those guys got behind us and made a big difference. Um, then overseeing the doubling is kind of a, uh, I know it's an interesting way to put it, but you know, I was there when it happened. Um, it's actually a lot easier to manage um, a big increase in the budget than it is to manage what we're going through now, which is flat funding, because you can do a lot of new things without stopping anything. So you have to be a little selective about what to favor, and I did try to do that by um, making institute directors tell me what they would do with their new money uh, by um, indicating special support for the efforts to sequence the human genome, uh, by uh, trying to increase the budgets uh, of institutes that were doing global health, which has become an increasing passion of mine. Um, and, uh, and yet that all is a lot easier than doing what we're all doing now, which is trying to decide what programs are not performing well, cutting them back or cutting them to zero, and, uh, and using that money so that new things can be supported. Right. Um, I want to change the topic a little bit then mm -hmm. to why you decided to leave to go to Sloan Kettering instead, Memorial Sloan Kettering yeah, Cancer well, Center. Yeah, well, you know, that, that's, uh, it wasn't a matter of saying I didn't like NIH anymore. It was uh, the, the issue was how, how long can you be an effective leader and to a certain extent what kind of promises have you made to your wife? So, or your spouse, <laughs> to be more PC about it. So, um, my wife had grown up in Washington. When we went, she came along, but uh, um, she said, let's not do this any more than six years. So, as the six-year point neared, I began to think about other options. There were some other considerations. One is that I think it's unfortunate that the NIH director and the NCI director um, are appointed by presidents and tend to be um, uh, tend to turn over with presidents. Uh, I think it'd be much more reasonable to have some kind of fixed term and uh, have those terms not synchronized with the presidency. Because these are not political positions and it is unfortunate when someone gets appointed and then has to leave because a new president's been elected. So I was hoping that by leaving roughly a year before the next election that somebody would get appointed and carry over across the, across the election. But that, those plans turned out not to have worked out. But, um, so there were a lot of factors involved. And then, um, you know, I had, I think anybody who's in a leadership position, or almost anybody, begins to feel that after six or eight years, you've done most of the things you wanted to do. Um, for me, it took about eight years at Sloan Kettering. Uh, it took about five or six years at NIH. You know, the, there were programs, buildings, um, changes in policy, things, you learn what you could never do and you learn what you could do, and if you got them done, then your interest in the job began to flag. But I did learn at the NIH that there were a few things that I really liked. They were new things and somewhat surprised me. One is I liked running institutions, that I liked meetings as long as I was in charge of the meeting and decided when it started and ended and who was going to be there. Um, and I wanted to do another leadership position. I, and um, I thought my chances of doing that were probably greater if, I'd, if I left for something new before I was 60, because people do like to hire folks who are not superannuated. 
So uh, I also knew I wanted to be in New York, which I loved and had missed in California. Uh, and then an opportunity came along at Sloan Kettering because there I could be the leader of an institution. I could continue to do research. The institution was, was not um, sub subject to a larger university or to some larger forces, just a supportive board. Very, very attractive to me. And um, I jumped for it. And you were there for 10 years, yes? A little over 10 years, right. 10 years. So then what precipitated the desire to go back into a more governmental directorship? Well, I wasn't looking for a government job. I, was, uh, I knew after about seven or eight years at Sloan Kettering that I'd gotten done the big things I wanted to do. That is, I, I wanted to enlarge the, the research community at Sloan Kettering and improve it. Um, and I had to build a building for that, so we raised a lot of money. We built a beautiful new building. Uh, I wanted to reorganize the scientific enterprise there by bringing clinicians and, and basic scientists closer together. That was achieved. I wanted to have a new, some new kinds of training programs, and we had several developed, including our own graduate school. Um, so a lot of the things that I sought to achieve there, I had done, and I knew I was beginning to uh, uh, show um, less um, originality in the way I thought about the next phase at Sloan Kettering. I just was, also we had a change in the economy so that uh, um, when I first got to Sloan Kettering the big problem was the 9-11, the fear of terrorism and general uh, anxiety, um, but my board was very supportive about building a new building and moving ahead and hoping that the world would not disintegrate into, uh, in, in, into chaos. Um, and it did not, um, but the economic changes were important uh, and it meant that there would be fewer resources um, from the government or from, uh, from philanthropy, although philanthropy did maintain itself pretty well at a strong um, developmental place like Sloan Kettering. Um, but I knew I needed to do something else. I was also getting close to 70 at that point and my fellow leaders, there were four people who were at the top of the pinnacle, they were all in my age group. Uh, for aging white males, and you know, it seemed like it was time to, to give them a, a, new, a new shot at uh, developing a leadership team. So I told the board I would step down, and I really wasn't sure at all what I would do next. So the, the obvious step would be just to stay on at Sloan Kettering, do my research, maybe shift focus a little bit, make my lab a little larger, um, and that would have been fine. But uh, there's something wrong about staying on in an institution that you've influenced pretty, pretty profoundly and care a lot about and watch someone else lead it. I just, just made me nervous. So I began to think about other possibilities. At the same time, I was quite active politically. I had picked up on Barack Obama early on. Um, I worked for him in the campaign. I ran his science and technology committee during the, during the, the election. Um, uh, I was appointed, while I was still at Sloan Kettering, to co-chair his, uh, his um, uh, committee on, on uh, Science and Technology, and uh, um, I was interested in, 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 in helping him and serving uh, his administration. So I was part of the transition team. I was trying to help the administration find candidates to run the National Cancer Institute. Uh, and at one point, a former student of mine looked at me and said, why don't you do it? And you know, I really, it really hadn't occurred to me because people tend not to think that if you were the chief of something, you should now become a lieutenant. And uh, while I don't think of my job as necessarily a lieutenant's job, you know, in the hierarchy of NIH, um, being an institute director is below being the NIH director. However, um, when I was at the NIH the first time, I had something which I used to call institute director envy. That is, the NIH director doesn't have a lot of money at his disposal. The budget for the NIH ran, uh, went from 13 billion to about uh, almost 20 billion by the time I left. It's a lot of money, but all that money is appropriated directly to the institutes. And the NIH director has a relatively small amount of money. That amount has increased over the years uh, due to changes in the authorization um, bill for the, for the NIH. But still, being in charge of a $5 billion budget at the NCI and using that budget to do science um, connects you with the scientific community in a much more profound and muscular way than, than, uh, than, than being director of NIH. And I thought that would be a lot of fun. I mean, I, I had spent 10 years at Sloan Kettering 
trying to, to build our research community to take advantage of all kinds of new opportunities, genomics, accessibility to patient samples, um, new mouse models, um, new other ways to study how uh, important uh, um, factors in, in the control of cell behavior could be uh, in, interfered with. And, um, so I thought it was a particularly exciting time in cancer research in a time when it would be great to have authority over the way in which we give out money for doing this kind of work, how we assemble the teams, how we uh, inspire people to do work that, uh, that moves quickly. Uh, in fact, even with a budget that is fundamentally shrinking, we actually have lost a little bit of real dollars, but in constant dollars, the budget is going down several points every year because uh, inflation still moves along, uh, science is more expensive, and our budget uh, remains just about flat and will probably do so for the next several years. So that's a real challenge in management. Right. And um, when you really believe that the science we're doing is useful, uh, and that there are ways to do it better, uh, being in that kind of position is pretty invigorating. Okay, so in terms of the financial picture that you're, you've just painted and the challenges that mm -hmm. there are, what's your advice to trainees when they find this funding landscape so bleak? Like, What initiatives are you pushing the most at the NCI yeah. that you think there are the most opportunities in right yeah, now? Yeah, well I think your question actually is multi-layered in the sense that uh, you know, there, there is a financial problem because the success rate <coughs> for, <coughs> for grantees <coughs> is relatively low. So that's sort of in some ways independent of the issue of what the biggest, biggest opportunities are because in every domain of NCI or NIH sponsored research, the competition is severe. Overall at the NIH last year, the success rate for a grant applicant was about 17%. The NCI was about 14%. <clears throat> we ensure that new investigators have at least as good a success rate as more senior people, but it's still tough. Uh, and uh, yet you have to see this in a broader context. Most people who are trained to do biomedical research have a job. Two, my sons are in the arts. They find it very hard to get jobs. Their success rate is lower. Their community has a lower success rate than people doing biomedical science. But it's terrible to be um, a trained and employed biomedical scientist and not be able to get an NIH grant, which is, of course, the, the coin of the realm. So this is a serious problem, which we're not going to solve in any simple way. Remember that even in good times, the, the success rate is, is likely to be in the 30 to 40 percent re region. So right. not everybody ever gets funded or should ever get funded. But we're in a, in a, in a draconian era in which much too, many too few, um, let me start that again, uh, which, which um, an unacceptably small number of people are getting funded to get, to get their research programs underway. So that's unfortunate. There are a lot of other sources of funding. Many more of them were available uh, when I was a boy. Um, you know, in those days, the, the American Cancer Society was basically the only funder in town besides the NIH. But now institutions have a lot more money for, um, I mean, they're all hurting too, but they do have a lot of money to get people started. There are state programs like the CPRIT program in Texas. There are programs that are developed by advocacy groups, melanoma, lung cancer, leukemia and lymphoma. Um, vast numbers. There's the, the Stand Up to Cancer program, and all of these folks are doing very well and, and helping to support what some people call the National Cancer Program, the complete constellation of, uh, of funding mechanisms for, for supporting science. So it's not all that bleak. Now, with respect to what needs to be done, there are a lot of interesting things, and I can't review them all, but I want to point to a few things. First, um, it is absolutely clear that we're at, at the moment in which um, we are painting for the first time a clear picture of what is going on in a cancer cell by sequencing genomes, looking at rearrangements, studying gene expression patterns, looking at DNA methylation, uh, looking at the expression of microRNAs, uh, looking at the expression of biomarkers, potential biomarkers, and all these things are being done on a very rapid, high throughput scale in a way that presents all kinds of fa fascinating experimental opportunities. First, there's the opportunity to paint this picture 
team efforts that require special kinds of handling of our personnel, but I think it's been extremely successful. The folks who work in the most prominent of those projects, the Cancer Genome Atlas, are very enthusiastic about working in large teams in which their own efforts tend to be submerged. And one of the things I'm very interested in is changing the way we write our CVs, our biosketches, mm -hmm. so, that, so that everybody can, can describe what they've contributed to a team effort, not simply list their name as one of 300 people who worked on a project. Mm -hmm. Secondly, all of these projects are, are generating all kinds of new ideas because this information um, is just that, just information, not understanding. So if you see that a gene is mutated in several cancers, it doesn't mean that it's actually making uh, a contribution to those cancers, and it doesn't tell you what kind of contribution that gene might be making. So there are tremendous opportunities for new kinds of functional studies that are basically fundamental science, but they also offer therapeutic and diagnostic um, uh, opportunities for what the word now is translating our science in, into, uh, in, into clinical benefit. Um, so I think there's a lot of reason for someone who is interested in cancer research to be extremely excited about getting into this field, even though um, so the chances of succeeding, of succeeding are uh, definitely less than they used to be. But they're still pretty high. And if you're talented and you believe in this stuff and passionate about it, you're going to succeed. Interesting. Um, I want to turn a little bit now to your, um, your biography lists your passion for writing and that you've authored over 300 scientific articles, five books, and including a memoir in 2009. Mm -hmm. what, what made you decide in 2009 it was time to write a memoir? Well, I wish I had decided in 2009 and written it in 2009. I, this was, um, um, a, it began as, a, as an obligation when I was invited to give a series of lectures called the Norton Lectures, sponsored by W.W. W. Norton Publishers at the New York Public Library. So a friend, uh, Gene Strauss, who was in charge of that program, asked me to give these lectures. Um, the dates are easy to remember because they coincided with the 2004 elections. Um, and uh, I very much enjoyed giving the lectures, one on becoming a scientist, one on uh, being a scientist, one on being a political scientist. Uh, and uh, in the fine print, it said, Norton expects you to publish these lectures. And you know, I naively thought, okay, I give the lectures, somebody types them, I publish them, no problem. But when I went back, I realized that you could not simply publish these lectures in the, in the way they were given and have it make sense, that uh, there's something about Context. a lecture that's different. You, you know, the, 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 the level of the prose, the, the, the depend I used slides in some of the lectures that, that wasn't going to work. So um, I decided why not take this opportunity to write something bigger uh, wh where I explored in greater depth my becoming a scientist, went into some detail about at least certain aspects of my career in science as, a, as, a, as someone who worked at the bench and mentored other scientists. Uh, and then talk in much more detail about my experience as NIH director and about three or four things I really care about, global health, uh, science publishing, uh, and uh, stem cell and embryo research. Uh, and um, so I wrote the policy, question, policy chapters about those topics and then tried to end with a, a broader world view of how I think scientists operate as individuals and as members of communities. So um, the writing process, you may you saw about my passion for writing. Well, I don't know, I have a passion for reading and I like literature, but being a writer is tough. It's very different writing a semi-formulaic scientific paper, which we all write because we've got to get our work out there and we want the, the, the prestige and, the, and the, we want the information that we've developed in the lab to be seen by everybody and put it into a somewhat formulaic um, form, um, but, and, and writing something that's intensely personal, um, even though my book does not have much about my sex life, but it's, but it's still personal because your, your scientific life is also personal. Um, um, but that turned out to be a pretty difficult process. I had bought a house in the country. I thought I'd go up there in the summer, and I'd spend four, days a, four, four hours a day writing 
But no, I was distracted by tennis and bike riding and swimming and other things and didn't make much progress. And it wasn't until I suddenly realized I've been working on this book off and on for four years and I'm nowhere near finished. Um, I did have the privilege of having a great um, publishing house already have declared its interest in publishing it, so there was that motivation. Uh, and I finally said, I can't go on with this, and uh, in 2008 I'm going to finish this book, and it doesn't matter what I'm doing. So at the end of a long working day at Stone Kettering, I came home and I just wrote for four or five hours, and then I finally was able to pull it together. So I, I'm very glad I did that, beginning to think about another book, but, it, but, uh, but I can tell you it was not easy, it was not even the writing was never fun. Right. Would you have done if science had not uh, been your chosen profession? Well, I think that's, I mean, I think there are at least three things in that list. Uh, one is journalism, um, which I certainly entertained for a while when I was running the Amherst College newspaper. Um, and my wife is a journalist, and uh, I like what she does. Um, second possibility would be a professor of English literature. After all, I was on my way there as a graduate student and liked that a lot. Um, I wish I were more talented either as a musician or as an athlete to have entertained careers in those areas. I love bike riding. I don't think I have the, 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 the strength, talent, and competitive spirit um, in high enough uh, uh, quantity to be a professional bike rider, but uh, I would find that entertaining. or. I'm not sure I could maintain the pace required either to be a, a, a member of a, of a chamber quartet or, a, um, um, or on the, the, the professional tennis cycle, but uh, those would be things I would enjoy doing. The problem is I probably would only want to do them 10% of the time. And yet science remains something you want to do 90% of the time? Well, I don't do science 90% of the time. That's pretty clear. I mean, I, I do... I, most of what I do professionally is science related, but doing science to me is still doing experiments and designing them and, and uh, thinking about them with your colleagues. And I spend uh, the majority of my time worrying about running an institution, a big institution with a big budget and thousands of employees. Um, so that's my main task. Um, it is science related, um, but I do science in, with my own laboratory and the postdocs and technicians who work in it, um, much more like uh, 15 or 20 percent of my time, maybe not that. So, you know, that, you know, I, it's just a question of finding the right kind of balance, and I don't want all my time to be um, at work. I still do a lot of uh, sports, and I, uh, I'm reading a lot of books, and uh, I go to opera and theater and art galleries in New York, it's one of the reasons I like living here um, part of the week. and. Uh, you know, achieving that kind of balance in life is something that, uh, frankly, is not supportive of the kind of intensity that you need and I once exhibited in trying to achieve something um, that's uh, at the highest level of science. Well, thank you very much for joining us yeah. today. We really appreciate your time and My your pleasure. insights. Thank you. Thank you.